Welcome to Maxwell Unplugged. In this episode, we're honored to host two distinguished guests, Suyin Ko SC and Loretta Mellon Toppy, as they share their parallel journeys in international law and arbitration. So here we are today, practicing international arbitration in Singapore. Well, we come from very different backgrounds. We grew up in different countries. We started the practice of law at different times, and we were trained in different legal traditions. Yet, somehow, we are both sitting here today, practicing in the same melting pot of Singapore. I thought that it would be quite interesting if I could just start off by asking Loretta, so what was your background? How did you start the practice of law in the first place? Hi, Sui. First of all, thank you very much for this really good introduction. We thought it would be fun to contrast and compare our past experiences that led us to the same point, which is Singapore. And that is, in a way, the beauty of international law and the practice of international arbitration. It's through meandering ways you wind up practicing as counsel or as an arbitrator, no matter where in the world, no matter where you come from. So I originally studied law in Rome, so I'm an Italian lawyer by training, but I always had an interest in international relations and international law. My father was a professor of international law, and so in a way I was kind of destined for something like this. But at first I wanted to be a diplomat, and then I thought that perhaps it wasn't the ideal profession for a woman. It didn't combine, you know, personal and professional life very well, but those were different times, of course. And then I discovered the practice of international arbitration and international dispute resolution in general. So I started out working with states in state-to-state -state disputes, and I was very lucky because I had an amazing experience uh, sharing cases with some of the best and the brightest names in our field. And Singapore uh, came as a bit of a coronation of my activity, and I came here just before I started working as an arbitrator. But after I had worked with uh, a team of Singaporeans and my partner in life, Rod Bundy, as counsel for Singapore in the Pedro Branca case. So Singapore was no stranger to me. But when I came, I was amazed by the real effort that was ongoing, not only on the part of the practitioners in the local community, but also on the part of the government to promote international law, the rule of law and international arbitration. So. In a nutshell, this is me. What about you, Sui? Um, well, my path is rather different from yours. Um, first, I did not have any of my parents who were practicing as lawyers, so it wasn't sort of a natural path for me. Um, quite contrary to that, I am what they call an accidental lawyer. Um, I did not know what I wanted to do after I finished college, and my sister simply said to me, you should do a professional degree. And by the process of elimination, I eliminated engineering, I el eliminated accountancy, and then I enrolled myself in the Faculty of Law at National University of Singapore. So um, I'm trained as a Singapore lawyer, which is different from you. Um, mine is a common law tradition, your civil law tradition. And um, how I really got into the practice of um, international law was through uh, my professor in school, whom you may know, and you have seen in the space of international law, Professor Robert Beckman. So I enrolled in one of these mooting programs and he told me that um, it would be really good for me if I had um, you know, picked up the subject called public international law as one of my optional modules. And having grown up and being um, brought up in Singapore, Taking the public international law course was a real eye-opener for me because prior to that, um, in the course of our studies in Singapore, we never had the chance to really experience what international law really was. And I guess for you, it was quite different because right from the very start, um, you had that exposure from your relationship with your father and after that, when you did your state-to-state -state disputes. So when I started doing public international law, I thoroughly enjoy it in law school. And um, that really um, opened my eyes. It showed me a different part of the world and what the international law order was. And it continued after I graduated um, from law school because um, when, when I was started practice, I started practice clerking for the Chief Justice. 
and um, we I then worked in Wong Partnership, the local firm. I again never thought that I would practice public international law, being in a Singapore law firm. But like what you mentioned, the Singapore government is one of the key factors that has really cemented and brought international law to us Singapore lawyers by being involved. They are themselves are involved in some of the thought leadership, involved in some of the state-to-state -state disputes. You mentioned Petrobanker. But more critically, um, they successfully um, showed the world how effective Singapore can be as a seat for investor state arbitration. And that was, in fact, my first exposure to a Singapore seated investor state arbitration in 2013. And I will always remember that because when I was at that hearing, I was pregnant with my son, Jake. So that was in 2013, my very first exposure to practice in public international law. Did you plead in that case? Did you do some of the advocacy? Oh, not at that point in time. In fact, um, at that point in time, the international law firm that was working on the case and we were brought in to assist because it was seated in Singapore was the Bovoise and Flimpton. So um, the tribunal members and all the counsel always remember when I walked into the hearing room because despite me playing a very small role compared to them, I occupied a very big space with my pregnant <laughs> stomach. With your big tummy. <laughs> with my big tummy. Um, so, you know, Loretta, you know, you had a very good early years during the state to state disputes before you moved to Singapore and um, you did the Pedro Banker dispute. I just wanted to ask you, what did you find was most memorable in those first few years of your practice? Well, first of all, what I omitted to say earlier and I should uh, mention is that after I graduated and uh, became a, a, uh, an Italian lawyer, I passed the Italian bar, I moved to Paris and lived in Paris for 25 years. So my practice was mainly in Paris in those years. And um, so I think perhaps the most, the highlight of my career in those years was the cases that I worked on before the International Court of Justice. And there is nothing better, I think, for a lawyer than appearing before the world court and to be able to represent a state before the world court. My first experience was in the Indonesia-Malaysia case, and it was a case concerning sovereignty over two islands, Pulau Sipadan and Pulau Ligitan. And that was just before uh, the Pedro Branca case. So I, we represented Indonesia in that case. And because I was doing the maps in that case, uh, people thought I was a great map expert. And, and so Singapore hired me on that basis. I was doing all the cartography for that case. So that was quite a lot of fun. And I remember that my counterpart at the time, the other lawyer on the other side from Malaysia was James Crawford. Oh. So that was rather intimidating for those who are listening and know who Professor Crawford was, one of the greatest legal mind of our, minds of our time. And and I was, you know, a bit terrified, I have to say, to be appearing against James. And and but I remember that one of the interpreters in the Peace Palace came up to me and said, Well done. You're going up against Professor Crawford. We're all rooting for you. And then of course this was not a major part of the case. But nevertheless, it was it was a fantastic experience. And it kind of keeps you on your toes when you have those kinds of adversaries. Yes, and um, talking about James Crawford, um, he was also our opposing counsel in an ISID arbitration. And um, that was actually one of the last cases that he did before he was appointed as a judge of the ICJ, after which he could no longer practice as counsel. So I had that same experience as you, um, the sense that um, James Crawford is going to be the opposing counsel. But again, we were very comforted by the fact that uh, we prevailed in that case and the tribunal <laughs> yeah, was <laughs> complimentary. So, but it makes us keep us on our toes. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and what do you find most interesting about these, the sort of practice? What, is, what do you find most, you know, attractive and what keeps you going? Well, what I, what I found attractive when I was like you, mainly counsel, was the advocacy. I mean, the buzz, and I'm sure you agree with that, the buzz of the advocacy, also reacting on your feet when you have to rebut the arguments on the other side, uh, and you feel that you are accomplishing something important, uh, 
particularly good cross-examination when you gain some points by examining an expert witness or a fact witness, that's quite a lot of fun. And that kind of, um, you know, thrill, obviously, I miss today as an arbitrator. But there are different satisfactions in a way in the in the career of an arbitrator. And one of them is, I think, to be able to rule over the proceedings in a way, I mean, I, I shouldn't use the word rule over, but to run the proceedings in an efficient manner. I really like when I chair a tribunal to try and be efficient and to uh, try and instore a dialogue between the tribunal and the parties, because I think that would be to everyone's best interest. Uh, from an early stage and to perhaps have meetings in the course of the proceedings to let that dialogue continue. Do you, do you enjoy being an arbitrator, Sui? Um, I think, um, like you, I love the adrenaline rush being an advocate. So that truly is my number one passion. And um, that forms really the majority of my work, council work, as compared to yourself now, primarily arbitrator work. Um, that said, I do sit as an arbitrator. I get appointments from institutions, from parties, as sole arbitrator, presiding arbitrator, party appointed. And what I enjoy the most about being an arbitrator is that it makes me a better counsellor. So when I sit as an arbitrator, I start to see things from the lens of an arbitrator. And when I see things from that lens, I start to understand and appreciate what are the things that really irritates a tribunal? What are the things that really do not matter? What are the things that perhaps taking a very aggressive or very sort of um, confrontational tone is not and does not work for most arbitrators? And that really helps me to become a better counsellor, not just in the written advocacy, but also in the oral advocacy. So that I really enjoy. Do you have cases involving Western Council and Western parties, or do you mainly work with Asian Council in your cases as an arbitrator? Oh, um, in fact, um, my cases sitting as an arbitrator um, has been pretty diverse. So a lot of the parties come from all over the world. They are not just like Asia Pacific parties, but they also involve European parties. And I think for yourself, um, that must be the same. Yeah, it is absolutely the same for me. And I was asking the question because I'm curious whether you feel that there is a real difference in the way uh, the council approach the cases. You mentioned the fact that they can be extremely aggressive sometimes. And I agree with you, tribunals absolutely hate that sort of thing. It's not uh, conducive to a good, uh, a good case, a good... Um, outcome and it's uh, certainly frustrating for tribunals sometimes to witness those exchanges which really lead nowhere. But I was curious whether you have experienced that coming more from your Asian counterparts or from Western can, or common law as opposed to civil law. Do you notice a trend uh, of when it comes to the bad conduct of counsel yeah. in cases that you yeah. have appeared so in? You see, um, I generally don't like to stereotype and to say because you come from a particular um, sort of um, tradition that therefore you behave in a particular way. But um, due to the different legal training, I do observe that uh, the civil lawyers tend to be less aggressive. Less confrontational. Conf less confrontational. Perhaps, yeah. Whereas um, the common lawyers, they tend to take a more... Um, adversarial approach and uh, that might just be due to the system that the common law system is adversarial and the civil law system is inquisitorial so that's something that um, I do see but international arbitration and the way that I see how it has evolved is that it has really converged converged in the sense that you are seeing what is a conversion of best practices so increasingly, you have um, lawyers who come from all over the world, different traditions, but they do speak the same language and they do have best practices. But, you know, some civil law lawyers will tell you that the Anglo-Saxon firms and the American firms in particular dominate the procedure and that, in fact, they influence the procedural approaches in international arbitration a lot more 
than civil law lawyers. Um, you know, take the example of document production and how it's how it's gotten completely out of control in some instances. So some some of my colleagues from uh, like me, a civil law jurisdiction, complain a bit about that, and they complain about witness evidence or expert evidence that they consider as being, uh, you know, often partisan, to say, <laughs> to say the least, and to be an influence of the common law system. But you're right. I mean, it's very hard to stereotype and to, and it's not a good idea to generalize. Nevertheless, we all tend to do it to a certain extent. Yeah. So, you know, you've practice as counsel and then you evolve, um, you then focus now sitting as an arbitrator and you have extensive um, years of experience and I'm not going to reveal your age. No, so I'm not going mind. to um, ask you how many <laughs> years you've been in practice, but in this many years of practice, um, what are the main changes that you have seen in the field of international arbitration? Oh dear. Um... I think I would reveal my age if I tell you that I have seen a lot of change <laughs> from the beginning. I mean, the main and the most striking for me, which influenced my career to a certain extent, was that when I started again in Paris in the practice of international arbitration and international law, there were no dedicated teams of lawyers that did exclusively arbitration. Of course, there were no arbitration days, let alone arbitration weeks, which seems to be quite the norm nowadays and perhaps in, in a, a bit excessive in a certain way. But so arbitration was not a thing. It was not a business. It was not the way it is today, uh, a market. And there was no arbitration community. That developed for better or for worse in in the century, um, in the 2000s you know, perhaps the beginning of 2000 and so on. And and that certainly has its great advantages, some disadvantages as well. The market was smaller, there were less players, and perhaps as a result, less challenges of arbitrators. Um, the atmosphere was not as tense and confrontational um, on the part of counsel because there were a lot of people who were practicing and knew how to behave, to conduct themselves in an international context. So it was a small group of people, not as small as the public international law environment, which at the time was tiny, but, you know, it was rather small compared to today. And that's been growing and that's a good thing. The other excellent thing is the fact that so many more women have managed to break into the field, not only as counsel, and as arbitrators, but also to play a role in as counsel in a team, as doing some of the advocacy or, you know, cross-examination of the witnesses. So that's a very positive aspect of the changes that I've uh, witnessed over the years. And I wish there were more women arbitrators, particularly tribunals of three women, which um, I only have one at the moment, but, you know, it's the first time, can you believe it, in so well, many years. That's um, really interesting because um, I've, um, and I'm currently sitting in an all-woman tribunal and um, it was a, an L LCIA arbitration. And when it happened to me, um, I, I guess that shows how it is improving and it is becoming better because you've sat for so many years and it was only recently that it's yeah. your first. But now for me, I have already experienced my first and I'm sure moving forward, I will experience many more of a three-woman tribunal. It would be the norm. Yes. But one thing that I always say that I wish I could see more, it's gender diversity is great, and we certainly have benefited from that. But I think geographic diversity and ethnic racial diversity is extremely important. And I don't see as many Asian counsel pleading in Asian-related cases or African um, as one should. We still have the international law firms um, and a bit the usual suspects to a certain extent. Or, you know, these counsel appearing before the world court as well. Mm. I mean, uh, you know, usually it's the agent of the country that does the advocacy, but yeah. it's, it's increasing and that's changing as well, but we're not completely there yet. Yes, yeah, so uh, this is a point that I truly echo and I truly be believe and I agree with you. Um, we've done well on the gender diversity, but definitely not on the geographical and cultural diversity. And um, that's not just the case um, about, you know, counsel. I think for counsel, definitely there needs to be more faith 
and this is more faith from the client's perspective to understand and to appreciate that the Asia Pacific Council uh, can do just as good, if not better, a job as the sort of international counterparts as perhaps um, may just be a subconscious um, bias due to the long history of tradition of the international law firms who have been practicing international arbitration for many more decades than many of the Asia Pacific law firms, which are much younger. So I think this is one thing that um, clients would need to look at to really look at not so much um, just think of um, the the fact that um, they only look for the international counsel, but they should look for the counsel that is best for the case at hand. Um, but on that same note, I think it is also the case when it comes to arbitrators. So especially for yourself when you sit on both commercial and investor state cases, I think you do see that um, there isn't sufficient Asia Pacific arbitrators. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. In, in the field, so that's also something which is all of us in this community. We talk about this community should work at to try to address. Absolutely, I think it's it's very very important, and I uh, particularly cherish the tribunals where I have uh, co-arbitrators who are from different continents and completely different legal cultures. It's amazing to see how we, in the end, uh, in spite of our differences, manage to really get along and bring something additional to the table when we have those differences. It makes it all the more interesting. Yeah, it's um, like what you said, um, the arbitration community, I believe, and it growing, it's actually a very positive thing. So just like um, last Friday, we had IBA Arbitration Day in Singapore and you were one of our panel speakers on IBA Arbitration Day. And that brought together more than 450 practitioners, whether as counsel, whether as arbitrators, all in this little red dot Singapore. And I thought that was amazing. Well, particularly when you think that there were people who came all the way from Latin America. Exactly. And it's just what I love about interna international arbitration is precisely this, the opportunity to meet, interact, learn from people from all over the world and just to listen to their stories, not just about law, but about their lives, about how they grew up and the experiences they have. And that's what I enjoy very much about international arbitration. Yeah, we're a bit of a nomadic tribe, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> So we've come a long way. We still have a lot to do, to accomplish. What do you think the future has in store for us? Are you an optimist or we live in very, very dark times at the moment? I like to maintain my optimism, but it's not always easy. How do you see the world of international dispute resolution going forward? Do you think arbitration will live to see another century? Um, I am an optimist. And because I'm an optimist, I do believe that it will live for the next century and beyond. And international dispute resolution, particularly international arbitration, is going to become increasingly important, particularly for entities who are based in Asia Pacific. And this I actually see is the golden age for Asia Pacific based practitioners, counsel, arbitrators to really ride the wave because law follows business and when we see economic growth shifting to Asia Pacific, naturally with it there'll be more disputes. With more disputes you need a mode of dispute resolution and a mode and one of the most effective modes of dispute resolution would be international arbitration because it is that bridge between people coming from different jurisdictions and people not wanting to subject themselves to any particular national cause. So to me, the future is very bright. What about you? Well, I think the future is bright because like you, I'm an optimist and I want to be an optimist. But I also think that we have to adapt to change and change has been coming for a long time. Change bring good change, but also bad change that we have to confront and live with and find solutions for. So arbitration is certainly one of those solutions, but it's probably not the only tool in the toolbox. And we have to keep thinking about other alternative means to dispute resolution because arbitration is not one size fits all necessarily, depending on the type of dispute. Sometimes, you know, there's been a lot of criticism in the investor investment arbitration field uh, 
of arbitration for a number of reasons, as we know, political, ideological reasons, and not of those, not all of those reasons are unjustified. So we need to really think very hard about what we are doing and what we should be doing going forward when sovereign interests are involved in these kind of cases, particularly when really intractable disputes having to do with climate change, with the environment, with human rights, with um, corporate and social governance are going to be affected. Is arbitration the answer? Always, perhaps not. But we have to think beyond that. And so let's keep a bright future ahead. And let's stay optimistic. Yep. Thank you so much, Sweet. It was great fun to have a chat with you as always. Yeah, likewise. And I think we could um, continue chatting for many more hours on this point. Yeah, maybe we should start our own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, dear.